Um, went to Lincoln Way East, so I'm a huge homebody there. <laughs> what year did you graduate? 2003 I graduated. So, yeah. <laughs> I can't remember, it's been a while. Um, so I'm going to lecture on fractures of the foot today. Um, just regular bone anatomy, I like to kind of go over the bones I'm going to talk about so you guys kind of understand at least where they are. Um, one of the biggest ones is the talus. Most people have no clue this bone even exists. Um, it's between your heel bone and your ankle bone. It kind of causes that joint. It's part of your big ankle joint there. Um, so we're going to talk about this fracture later, but in the, I'll show you again in these pictures. Um, this is just to kind of start. But people never know where this bone is. It's a forgotten sad bone. <laughs> the next one's calcaneus. Everybody knows this one. It's your heel bone. So it's the biggest, largest bone in your body. It's one of the stronger bones in your body. Um, when you do fracture the talus or the calcaneus, they are bad breaks because of where they are on your foot. They take a big load. Um, they take a big load every time you walk and every time you do stuff. So when you break these ones, it's really hard to break them because they're built to be strong. They're built to hold your body weight. Um, I don't know if anybody was here for the first lecture that was going on. But um, Dr. Kim was talking about how much you, how much weight goes onto your feet, and it's one and a half times your body weight ever just by walking. When you're running, it's eight times your body weight. So these belts are meant to be strong. They're meant to hold you up. So to break these, they're bad breaks and usually from bad, severe injuries. The navicular, um, this is a bone that's on the inside of your foot. So um, that's just kind of where it is on those two angles. So it's on the inside kind of from your big toe on that side. Cuboid is on the other side of it. Um, so that's just where that one is. Again, this is just to kind of give you a general idea of where these bones are. I'll review them every time when we go to those fractures. Cuneiforms, you have these three little cuneiform bones. Um, we keep it simple, middle, intermediate, lateral. <laughs> so it kind of works its way across. Um, and these can break, however, it's not very common that these ones fracture. Metatarsals, these are probably my favorite to talk about, and I will spend a lot more time on these ones, because uh, these are the ones where you're going to see your stress fractures and uh, running fractures, that kind of thing. So you're going to see a lot more fractures on these ones, because they're longer, they're thinner, and everything like that. So, um, and we number them one through five, the first one being connected to your big toe. So, and just not to keep it just about feet, I'd like to add in a few pictures of my animals along the way. This is my dogs, Petty and Abby. So, we used to, I lived off of, I did my training and residency in Lake Erie, um, in Erie, Pennsylvania. So, my husband at the time, he, well, still my husband, but we had a boat at the time. Um, and so my dogs would always come out there with us on the lake. Yeah, he did. Well, the little blonde one, she jumped off the front of the boat once and got went under the boat, so life jackets were a must with my dogs. They'd see a duck and they'd want it. So. so the biggest one is stress fractures. This is kind of the whole reason I chose this topic. I get stress fractures in my office all the time. Um, they were first described all the way back in 1855. They were known as March of Fatigue Fractures. So a lot of soldiers would get them because they were walking constantly on their feet. Um, the reason why you get these is repetitive forces on your bone. So it's not that it's one incident where you just broke it. The bone just gets weakened little at a time all the time. And then all of a sudden it does fracture and break. You're not going to have a huge bruise. You're not going to come in and say, I think I, you know, I broke my foot. You're going to come in and say, my foot just started hurting, and I'll start asking you questions. Did you do a new activity? Have you started Zumba or anything like that, such as I had one that went to Disney World. She, just because Disney World's huge. You walk around that all week, you have repetitive trauma to your foot. Um, so you, it's muscle fatigue. Runners will get this a lot, too, like marathon runners while you're training, anything like that. Um, most common areas to get your stress fractures are your metatarsals, those really long bones I've shown you. However, you can get these stress fractures in your cuboid, in your navicular, and your calcaneus, your heel bone. Most people who come in with heel pain, we always say plantar fasciitis and work it up like that. 
But if after a while that doesn't help, you want to rule out that they don't have a stress fracture in their cookie. It's a strong, strong bone, but you can weaken it after a while. So signs and symptoms, just tenderness. Sometimes you'll have some swelling over the area. Usually you don't see a lot of bruising in like a regular fracture. It's not like you remember that one incident where you sprained your ankle. This is a repetitive, very repetitive incident where sometimes you just don't really remember. But walking on it is hurt. It's hurt, it's painful. Just don't enjoy walking. And then that's funny, you're like, you could have a stress fracture. So it, the arrow's pointing to the fracture right there. As you see, it's not a typical break. You actually don't even see the break. You see almost what we call a bony callus going around the bone, where it's kind of forming and healing. This is actually a stress fracture already healing. So you can take an x-ray, but if you come in after one week after going to Disney World, you may not see that stress fracture on x-ray. You're going to only see a regular bone. You may not see a fracture line it's just this small little hairline fracture. X-ray, you may not pick it up. That's why we have a 14-day rule. At about 14 days, you'll start seeing a bony callus forming, and that means you have a stress fracture there. You still have to treat it, though, because it's healing, but you have to help it heal. Other ways to diagnose it are bone scans and CTs. I actually had a patient who came in who had a fracture. It was actually more towards, here we go, the base here. Very hard to see on x-ray. Didn't see it. Sent him for it. But something was really hurting him. He said that he remembered the incident was a month prior. So I said, you know, we should have seen something on x-ray by now. Sent him in. We found it actually on a CT scan. So we were able to find that, uh, that fracture. And then we treat it as a stress fracture. So not always can you see it on x-ray. So just because your x-ray is normal does not mean that you don't have a stress fracture. And that's huge importance because I get patients all the time who go to the ER and then they get told, oh, it's normal, it's not broken. And I go, it may still be broken, let's just wait another two weeks and take an x-ray. And then in that meantime, I still treat it as a fracture. I still treat it as that they have a fracture and put them in a boot. What's a bone scan? A bone scan? So a bone scan is basically using little nucleotides and going through your body and then um, it can pick up different things. It's very specific. It's very, um, they can find things on it, but you can't exactly say this is what it's caused by. Um, different things will light up on an x-ray, or uh, sorry, on a bone scan, such as um, arthritis may show. If you have a bone infection, that shows. Um, it shows a lot of different things, but if you know what you're looking for, it'll actually, there'll be like a little spot on it. It's really neat. It actually goes to the whole body, too, not just the, just the foot. So, it's a, it's a good exam, but it's not very, it can't tell you, yes, it's a stress fracture. It just says something's going on there. <laughs> that's all, but that's really all it says. That's why I actually prefer to do CTs or MRIs. Treatments, you can, um, best treatments for a stress fracture, decrease the activity. If you just started Zumba, stop doing Zumba for a while. Um, so other things though, I'm not gonna, I, I'm a huge believer in keeping people active and staying active. Obviously, if you have a fracture, you are going to have to cut back and not do things. There's certain things that you could do. Swimming. You could still swim and do kind of some stuff to keep active, at least in this time. Or at least change things to help prevent bone fractures. Change your footwear, making sure that you're wearing good inserts, good shoes, something supportive. So that way, when you're walking, it's not complete pounding just on your foot against the mat, that you have something in between. Orthotics are obviously a good thing to wear in there too to help take support off of just your metatarsals, those bones. Um, and fracture boots. Fracture boots are awesome now. They used to put you in a cast. I usually try not to cast any of my patients. I try to put people in boots because people like to shower. So that way you're still able to shower and do everything. Um, so I have had patients that I did put in a fracture boot once. Um, she ended up coming out of the shower and she broke her foot again. She accidentally, she sat on her bed because it wasn't hurting her. She forgot about it, didn't have her boot on, and she sat on her bed and sat on her foot and the bone popped and moved, so we actually had to do surgery for her. Whoa. Most times though, with stress fractures, you just immobilize it and let the bone heal. Bone heals within six to eight weeks. So within six weeks, you're usually good to go. 
Um, however, in that instance, she actually moved the bone, so therefore you actually had to do surgery because you had to put it back in place. Um, she actually had stress fractures in three of her bones on the same foot. We ended up sending her for, because that's very unusual to keep getting that many stress fractures. So, um, so we ended up sending her for what we call a DEXA scan, which basically checks for osteoporosis. Um, she was an older female, and then you have to worry about that because your bone quality is not as great. So, also living where we live, most of us all have vitamin D deficiency. It's not always sunny here in Illinois, so you have to. So because of the vitamin D, your bone quality is not as great as those in California. So especially for women in the cloudier areas, you're more susceptible to getting stress fractures. Is it better to break the foot than fracture the foot? They, it's the same thing. Is it really? Yeah, because I know I hear people say, oh, they should have broke the foot, it's better than fracturing the foot. And, no, breaking, you know. a, breaking a foot and having the bone break is the same as fracturing. So, um, oh, okay. so it's the same. The only thing is whether or not you, the bone moves. So maybe when they're talking about a break, as you can see the break, but it's stayed in place. Yeah. But if the break moves it, that's usually when surgery is required. Because there's only, there's some times where we could actually manipulate it to close reduce it without having to go for surgery. Um, but most of the time it requires surgery to put those two bones back together. So. But surgery, no. Um, so basically, it's the same thing. When it's together, that's good, but the recovery is still six to eight weeks. But when there is displaced, you still have to put it together and it's still six to eight weeks. So. Some people will try to get people out within four weeks into a regular shoe, but it's not like you're going to be out back doing Zumba at four mm -hmm. weeks. You're just in a shoe, but you still have to still let that bone heal. So like if you trip down the stairs or something like that, and just turn it mm -hmm. it takes a good six to eight weeks to probably get back. You know. If you break a bone, yes. Soft tissue is completely different when oh. you're talking about ankle sprains and stuff like that. Ankle sprains, they are longer to recover actually than an ankle yeah. fracture because a bone can heal faster than soft tissue. Soft tissue takes time. So that's probably what you're saying is, yeah, it, if you even see as professional athletes, they'll break bones all the time and then they're, they could make it towards the end of the season and be back playing. But if you actually like sprain your ankle or tear a ligament in a knee, those are longer recoveries and longer therapy. They tend to that's why when you sprain your ankle or you tear your ligament in your knee, these players are out for the whole season. Yeah, not quickly, but partial tear, it can recover without having to do surgery. Yeah. Will it be a complete recovery or is it always? It scars back. Um, it's always going to be a little bit weaker, but it should be okay. Most people, um, but especially ankle sprains, they'll actually immobilize them sometimes to see if they if it can heal on its own. But more and more physical therapy and early, you want that you want it to move. So people won't put you in a boot anymore for two months. People put you in a boot a little bit to help the swelling go down, but then you want it to move. It gives it time to heal. It's just a longer recovery. So when you sprain your ankle, you shouldn't really move it around. It's actually good to move it around. Yes. Um, because otherwise it gets stiff and then that's when the problems can come, come up. Especially for active young athletes. I have one that I just did, it. I actually went to surgery with her because she wanted to get back playing a lot faster. So, and I told her, you know, it's gonna be about three months for you to be playing or we can do surgery and we might be able to do two months. At nine weeks she'll be playing in a volleyball tournament. So, oh, yeah. after the surgery. So. so these are my cats. Oh. <laughs> Nickel and copper, they're little buddies, so. Do animals actually fracture their Yeah, they can. I actually had a cat who broke her leg, who broke his leg twice. So, yeah. So, yeah, the animals can break them. He was in a cast for a long time. So. I can't remember. It would have been like three months because he broke it and then. While he was in the cast, he ran under my mom, and my mom stepped on him and re ah. broke it in the cast. Oh, wow. So, oh, wow. It was bad. <laughs> um, so Taylor, 
fractures. That's the bone that most people don't even know exists. It's the one between your heel bone and your ankle, two ankles. Um, again, it takes a lot of force to, to break this thing. It's never a good bone to break. You get this from car accidents or some kind of trauma usually. Um, so avascular necrosis is a huge risk with this bone because of the blood supply to it. It has three main blood vessels that go to it. But if you actually, when you break the bone, you can actually cut off the blood supply to it, which means you could get avascular necrosis, which basically means bone loses the blood supply, therefore the bone can die. Um, one of my patients, or not my patients, my nurse who works at my office, she actually was in a motorcycle accident, broke her talus. It's a very bad bone. She, um, she did about 24 years ago, and she has severe arthritis in it now. Um, so she's looking at options, what she can do for it right now. And there's always options like later down the road, but if you break this bone, you're almost guaranteed to have arthritis. She was actually told her, um, she called it gangrene. It's not the same as gangrene, but what her interpretation was, the bone loses blood supply. She, luckily for her, hers did it. She turned out fine. She just has a lot of severe arthritis. Um, almost every day you can tell when she's, it's, she's hurting because she's lumping along. So, and there are surgeries that she can do to do it. She's just trying to put them off because she likes, she wants to work. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a huge outcome is you're going to end up arthritis in that ankle. Almost guaranteed. So this is a Taylor fracture. You can see the break right here. Um, this is a really bad one that's going to require surgery. Not all of them. Sometimes it's just where you don't, um, the immobilization, that's not to have a surgery. That's only one type of these fractures where it stays in line and doesn't move. And we have, in medicine, we all have classifications for everything. Only one would actually fit into this where you could be eight to 12 weeks, non-weight bearing, which means you're not able to walk on it. Um, however, if you do surgery like this one, that's surgery. You need to be able to put it back together. Um, and you're gonna be off your foot for about eight to 12 weeks. They're trying to now, things are a little bit faster where you, you can start putting weight on it because we have neat fracture boots now. We have something more than just the regular old cast that they used to have. So, um, and then more and more, early range of motion is better. So usually about six to eight weeks now, they're trying to get you into physical therapy and getting you moving and doing some exercises now. But this is a really bad bone to break. Um, and again, it takes a lot of force to break. Taylor Dome lesions, that little arrow is pointing to a little lesion. You can barely, barely see it right here. This is usually from an old ankle sprain. When you sprain your ankle, your bones move, and then this part would actually, this part would actually hit down into this, and this is cartilage there. But when you hit down and damage that cartilage, you get these like little fragments. This one's not too bad. You could actually probably just immobilize this patient and let it heal on its own. Sometimes these require surgery. Surgery now is very minimally invasive for these, depending on the size. Sometimes you could just go in there with a little ankle scope, you go in there, clean it out, and kind of microfracture, which is just basically stabbing your bone to create blood supply. Um, Dr. Kim talked about this earlier in his lecture as well. Um, but yeah, so if you get an ankle sprain and then you're staying like a couple months down the road, it's still hurting you, it's not getting better, it might be because you have one of these. Most people forget about it, but if you've ever had it where all of a sudden your joint is hurting you, and it's because months before you had a really bad ankle sprain, you probably actually damaged your cartilage inside that. So it's usually cartilage damage. Sometimes it is not seen on x-ray though. So you, uh, there's always the, this is an MRI, so what you have to do is, um, oh sorry, sorry, it's a CT. So when you look here, this is it right here. So this one is a really large one. This might actually where you have to like open it up and then use like a graft to replace the cartilage there. Uh, Dr. Kim was calling it as a pothole, like a pothole that you hit on the road. So he goes, you know, you might be okay some days, but then you might be bad on other days when you're hitting it, when you're moving around more. Um, when they happen and you see it right away, conservative treatment's usually okay, even surgical. However, if it's chronic, it's that person that's been hurting for eight months, it's almost always gonna go for surgery, because at that point, immobilizing, it's not gonna help heal it. It's past that already. So, and there's, like I said, different surgeries. Now we can do a lot minimally invasive, which is nice. 
with the ankle scope and little tools with that. And the ankle scope is just like two little one centimeter incisions on your ankle, and that's it. Then you put a little camera in there and everything, so. That's my lizards. I have a lot of them. Oh my gosh. I have like a mini zoo. <laughs> so that's them as babies on the left, and then them as bigger ones on, they're actually bigger than that now. Um, recently, they just had babies not too long ago. So my brother has one of the babies at home, so. <laughs> But George and Washington are their names. So calcaneal fractures. This is your heel bone fracture. This is a fall from a big height. So again, major injury to break this bone. Somebody who comes in, um, most commonly you fall off of a ladder and your heel bone breaks. Um, this bruising right here, this is a very significant sign of a calcaneal fracture. You'll see bruising all along the foot and on the bottom of the foot. You'll see if you got a fancy name called mom door sign. Um, just because it's very, it can happen a lot, um, and that's what you see. But it's usually a fall from a height or a car accident can cause these. Um, the other thing you want to check, though, because, and then this is something where if you ever go to an emergency department and you might think you have a calcaneal or heel fracture, they're always going to x ray your back. You're going to sit there and say, but it's my foot. What can happen is anytime when you have a calcaneal fracture, there's a high incidence of actually your fractures in your lower back of them having a compression fracture in your lower back. So most of the time they'll always, always get an x-ray of your back to make sure that there's no other fractures in your lower spine. Because it's like I said, it's usually fall from the height. The average height is anywhere from 12 to 14 feet. So your electricians that are working up on poles and stuff like that, your painters or something, when they fall, it's pretty serious, especially, I mean, this is a serious fracture. So you can kind of see it here. And it may not look too, too bad to everybody. There's a few little fractures, signs where you can see it's fractures here, and then right here it's not together. So it doesn't look too bad. So, but on these, you almost always want to get a CT because you want to know how bad it is and how many pieces it is. So this is one. Now you can see how many little pieces it is. It's one here, part here, kind of here. You basically blow it out. It's a very bad break. Um, the reason why you get the CT is to actually plan for surgery to figure out how you have to put it together. Again, it's, a, it's like a puzzle when you put it together. You put it back together with a lot of screws and pins. So treatments. Um, for some calcaneal fractures that aren't blown out like that, sometimes they will just do a cast and have you non-weight bearing. You're almost, either way, whether you do conservative treatment or surgical treatment, either way, you're going to be having arthritis down the road. Um, but when you do conservative, you can do sometimes close reduction, which just means no surgery. They're just like, they numb you up in the back of the leg and they kind of manipulate it to try to put it back into place. Um, most people, though, will take these to surgery just because there are better outcomes for the future. Arthritis gets to look a little bit better. It's better to kind of put the bones back where they belong. Mm -hmm. um, so the, this is a picture of a person who had one where they did just plates and so this is a typical plate. It's kind of the shape of it, and then you put everything together. Um, you, what you could do is actually fuse this joint right here between your talus and calcaneus. Some people do that right away, or some people will do it years later when you start getting really bad arthritis. So if you do get arthritis, you could fuse this joint right here. And that will just prevent your foot from going in and out sideways. You could still walk up and down, just not that other rotation. Um, some people use external fixation. That's um, those big bird cages. That's what I call them if you've ever seen anybody wear them. It's a basically big metal frame that goes on the outside of your foot and it puts everything together with pins. Um, that way there's no real hardware in you that stays in you and the pins and the rings all come off eventually. So, it looks like a bird cage on people. That's what, that's what all my patients said. It. Most people don't like them because they don't like the hassle of all of it. Um, most people will do the plates and screws. Some people will do combinations where they'll do some screws and then the external fixation. So those are my other lizards. <laughs> That's Sacagawea. She's a blue tongue skink from like New Zealand or something. And then Hank, who's my really mean iguana. Don't get an iguana. They're mean. <laughs> so, 
Another thing is, yeah, he's, he's way bigger than this. This is probably like last year, so he's way, way bigger than that now. Um, so another big thing is toe fractures. We get a lot of people who just even I think I broke my toe, what do I do? Well, you can get these through, the most common one is their fifth toe, which is this one right here, and it's called a bedpost fracture. The funny name is just because most people get up in the middle of the night, and then you're walking in the dark, and you hit your bedpost, and you, your toe goes out to the side. Right. Um, most of the time, people, <laughs> they're so brave, because I don't know if I could, but they pop it right back into place and go on to the bathroom, <laughs> like they were doing. Um, the best thing to do, though, is what we call a buddy tape splinting. So if it's this toe, you tape it to its buddy. You put a little pad in between, and you tape them together. It keeps them in line. However, you always do want to say, and people do try this at home for a while, but if it's really displaced, like the bones aren't connecting, you're going to need somebody to actually put it back in place. And what we would do in our office is just numb you up and do it there, get an x-ray, make sure it's in line, and then do buddy taping. Um, but it is important to go see a doctor about this, because if it's not in line, you're going to get really bad arthritis. Or worse is if it's up here, or even down here, if it goes through the joint, you're going to have a lot of pain and arthritis when it goes through the joint. So it's always good to get an x-ray, even on a small little toe fracture. What the big toe? The big toe? Big toes can happen too. Um, I think I might have a picture of it. Here we go. Here's a big toe fracture. This is a serious one where somebody may not have gone in right away for it. But you can see, that's really displaced. This might actually require surgery, just because it may not be able to go back together on its own. Um, this one will also require surgery. And then this is why you almost want to go to see a doctor for it, because some people will say, like, oh, I broke the toe, it's no big deal. But then, down the road, this is going to hurt. Oh, gosh. So, um, and then at that point, we're limited on what we can do. So, if you go in, the sooner the better, because then we can fix it right then and there, and then hopefully delay any arthritis down the road. So, this is a dislocated one. And then this is obviously fractured where it will probably require like a little screw to kind of fix it and put it back together. If you don't have it uh, put back in place right away, can it still heal itself if you do surgery? Or it, um, it it's harder it actually time? because when you don't do it, when you have it, try to let it heal on its own, you get that bony callus like we saw in that first x-ray with the stress fracture. And what that can actually do is you're going to actually have to take that out in surgery and clean it all up. So you could actually have a little bit extra bone loss, and you should, because it will try. Like when your bony, when your body heals itself, it doesn't heal itself with what you were born with. It heals itself with like a replacement version. So it's not the best bone. It's more of like a between like cartilage and a bone. It even feels different in surgery. So you could tell the good bone and the bad bone. Um, but if this person came in months down the line. Yeah, we'd have to probably go in there, kind of still clean it up. We basically refracture it in surgery and then put it back together. So sesamoid, I got at this because I take x-rays all the time, even for bunions and stuff like that, and people worry about these two little bones here. <laughs> they are normal. They're always there. Um, so you just have to know that they're normal. I get a lot of people who think they're fractures or broken bones or are these here. Um, so they're called your little sesamoids. They're very important though for your big toe. Um, a flexor tendon, one of your big tendons that moves your toe down and up, it goes right between here. And that, those two bones actually hold it together in place. So that way your toe can go, go up and down. Um, these can fracture. These are again, usually either, you can do it either way. You can either fall down really hard on it and fracture it, where you actually remember the incident, or it's just repetitive. A lot of dancers can fracture these, kind of get stress fractures in them. Um, sports, you're talking about your aerobics, long distance runners, marathon runners. Um, we get a lot of athletes basically can get this problem. Um, so this is one right here that's fractured. You can see that it's not, this one's all nice and pretty and smooth. This one, it's kind of cloudy. And it looks like it's an older fracture. So it looks like it's trying to heal itself. This one right here, it may look fractured, but this is normal. Some people are born with, instead of having just one tiny little bone there, they have two tiny little bones. They just heal, when they form, they form separately. So they have the one normal one here, 
and then this one separated into two, but it's, you know it's not broken, and the whole reason why is this is all jagged, it's cloudy, it doesn't look pretty. These two look pretty, just separate. Um, there's no cloudiness, there's no fracture, there's no jagged lines, it's very smooth, it's like it's, it, that's how it grew up to be, so that's normal. Um, what most people will do, they'll get bilateral x-rays, because most people will have these bilateral too, which means both sides. Um, treatments for these, most people will try conservative treatments, such as a boot, surgical shoe. Some people will even try steroid injections into the area um, or padding. If it's a true fracture, a bone stimulator would help. That's a, a device that you can put on your foot 20 minutes a day, and it just helps the bone heal a little bit better. Um, surgical options is basically if it's a small fragment, you could take the fragment out. Um, some people will take the whole bone out. But when you take this whole bone out, if you took this whole thing out, you have to remember it's holding that tendon there. It's helping that whole apparatus. So when these do get taken out, there are complications. If you take this one out, your toe can actually go into like a hallux. The big toe is called a hallux. But the big toe can go into what we call a bunion. Or the opposite of a bunion. Instead of it going this way, your toe can go this way. So some people, I try to never take these out. I've seen them done. They're not the easiest thing, because they're there for a reason. Um, they play a very important role into your foot in that big toe. And if you take it out, there's a lot of complications that can go about it. So I usually try that to be last option only. I try to do all the conservative. I try the bone stimulator. I try all this other stuff, because you don't want to take that out and then have this person end up with a bunion, and now they're mad. <laughs> A uh, very common one is Jones fracture. So with this, you probably have heard of it. I added the last couple ones. There's just like one or two slides for each one. Um, I only added this because it's a popular one if you watch a lot of football. Um, or in this case, Kevin Durant. He played for Oklahoma, or OKC which um, for basketball. He had a Jones fracture. It took him out for the whole season. It's a very bad break. So this one is actually... You can tell it's broken right here, where if it broke down here, it can heal pretty well. However, if you break it right at this area, there's not a lot of blood supply to this area of the bone. So when it breaks there, it's almost always a surgical issue to go get it fixed. Um, you could try to not do surgery on it and try to put it on weight bearing, but there's a huge chance of it not healing due to the lack of blood supply there. So more and more people will go get a pin thrown down. So you basically just throw a pin down this right here, and that way it fixes it, heals it, and it's a lot faster and better. Um, but the whole reason I add this is usually there's one or two athletes, like professionally, that break it a year. Liz Frank fractures. I added this because my husband told me I should. <laughs> um, he, you always hear about this in football a lot too, and. He gets excited now because he hung out with me and all my doctor friends and through residency, and he was really excited now that when he's he hears and they say Liz Frank injury, and he goes, oh, that's not a good one. <laughs> so um, Zach Miller from our Chicago Bears, who probably nobody even knows, he was our tight end last year. He went out in August and never even came back. Um, so we'll see if he plays this year. But um, he had a Liz Frank injury, and I mean he played I think two games. So, um, you could try to do close reduction. Again, that's manipulating the foot under anesthesia usually, manipulating the foot to see if it goes back in place without actually having to open up. However, with this, there's a lot of issues depending how bad the break is. This is a pretty severe one. This bone right here should be lined up with this. So all these bones right here shifted over. They shouldn't have shifted over that much. Um, this is a pretty, I wanted to pick an obvious picture. Some aren't this obvious. Some are just like little moved over. This one moved over a lot. This one would require surgery. The reason being is you actually have an artery that runs down this area. You have two tendons that are constantly pulling, and there's no way to close reduce that without a tendon or a ligament or something getting in the way. So this one would actually go for surgery. Sometimes you can move it and fix it without surgery, but that's, again, in very rare cases. Most people will go into um, surgery because it will heal faster and get better. So that's it. Any questions? I had a spur on my one toe. You know? And I think it was like a, it looked like a little temple, but the pain was excruciating. On your big toe? On your big toe. 
On your big toe? No, like on the second toe. Oh, okay. Yeah, some people will get, um... What is that hug? The spur? It's usually arthritis. So are you saying it was like somewhere around oh. here on your second toe? So people will get those like little spurs off of these joints and everything. Mm -hmm. That's usually yeah. arthritis. Um, I don't know if any of these have. Like this? <laughs> that's a very severe one. But you can get a spur. Spurs are actually pretty easy to kind of shave down. Um, that's again minimally invasive, where it's a little stab incision and we take almost like a burr, like a drill, um, and kind of just shave it down and take it off that way. Sometimes it's a pretty quick, easy recovery too for that. Well, it's very painful. Thank you. But yeah. No, it's fine. You guys have a great night. Yeah, it's 6.30 time. I guess they checked you in.